According to, to Michael, there's not going to be a free market for this. I, so, I that. assuming that my viewpoint will actually translate into a re realistic model, i.e., one that is workable, I would be very happy, by the way, for Google to be my only client. Mm -hmm. I will be satisfied with this uh, part of the game. But true. But on a more serious note, you know, even in patents, we have patent trolls, right? You know, companies that essentially harness a lot of power vis-a-vis -vis patents, but don't actually engage in research, right? And and we know that this is an offsetting aspect of patent protection, and that's part of the cost of doing business with a commodity. There may be, I don't want to say even abuse, because they may have you know, a legitimate platform to own property, also patents, but you know, some kind of way to capitalize on innovation. So why not even here? I mean, even if that were to translate into someone accumulating knowledge to sell it, at the end of the day, in my, you know, according to my, my viewpoint, that would translate into making less mistakes in research and getting fast, faster to Mars or what have you, whatever we do to, yeah. So, Peter, please. So, uh, follow-up question for both Neva and Amir. So, uh, I like the way you look at the data about that woman in um, Michael's uh, example. But my question for you is, would you consider, would you allow that woman to have any protection against the unauthorized use of that data? Uh, if so, on what basis? Right? Because it's not because the data belong to her, but there might still be other reasons why you actually believe that you need to get informed consent from that person. Right? I'm just curious as to how far would you go? And then for Amir, um, your examples about things that uh, have a pre-cut success and failure, right? Uh, but that's not always the case, and I think that's why we have uh, some questions along those lines. And I think a very good example is Viagra. Viagra is a very good example of how it has failed as a drug for heart disease. But it's very successful for other reasons, right? And so at what point would your proposal work for Pfizer uh, when we know that it has already failed as a drug for heart disease, but before we actually know that, it can be used for other purposes. So well, that's, that would be, uh, again, I see, sorry, I think, uh, uh, so, so the, the idea here is quite simple. When you own a commodity, you know what value you can attach to it or what potential value you attach to it. It's a gamble. If you choose to jump the horse, as it were, too fast, or to jump a gun too, too fast, and essentially to offer it for sale, and it turns out it has a twist that you missed, well, that's the kind of, that's your, your mistake. The, the idea is once you reach a conclusion within your scientific you know, uh, avenues that this has no longer any value to me and that I have no problem with risking it, that I am making life easier for my competitors, and by the way, this is cross-industry, so it's not about you know, us being two pharma companies, but it may be that he's a scientist in another field and needs my research vis-a-vis -vis rain and, and you know, effect on, uh, on uh, excuse me, vis-a-vis -vis effect of waves on knowing where it is actually raining physically on a certain point on the globe. Uh, that is, again, a kind of, uh, you know, cross-industry cross idea that also ties into the narrative that knowledge 
does not have any identity and may have value for different people differently. Once we make kind of a joke of people who are collecting bottles and you know, recycling trash or other things, and today we understand the value, the massive value of this industry, which both does good for society and does good for those who are engaging in it. So the same idea of recycling, but except that we are recycling. Recycling uh, data. Uh, 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 yeah. Excuse me? I said recycling data. Indeed, right? indeed. That's where kind of I come in and uh, you know thinking about a new brand for the recycling of data. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, on the I, I you know I don't want to go to be long because I think there's uh, lots of other questions. But just to make sure, I think that you know privacy should protect identifiable information. That is like that is a privacy interest that you want to protect. If someone is cannot be identified by you know secondary uses, I mean, if you secure the privacy, I don't think that you know that you should protect the right to you know that the person will control the use, the reuse of data down the stream for particular purposes or ideologies. I think it just creates so much, so many barriers on the type of innovation and public health, you know. Uh, Concerns or you know, public utility concerns, as early more was uh, describing, that I just don't think this is part of the deal. But that assumes it's easy to anonymize data, right? And it's still well, it, it's like it's anonymization. You know, it's a matter of you know how powerful it is. We have to secure that. But let's focus on what we have. We have to secure that. We don't have to ask people for that purpose. You know, what type of views they envision. What if she has this ideology and how she changed the party? Do we need to, to create a system that allows us to track that data and make sure that she can retract it just because she doesn't support it's that? The GDPR. I mean, I, I yeah. think <laughs> it's a bad system. I think it's a bad system. And I think that, I don't think it's it's workable. I think it does work. But I think it, it, cre it creates harm and it doesn't protect privacy. It's the end of the day. It protects, it creates a bureaucracy that is insufficient for protecting privacy and it is um, I think um, harmful for a lot of other public goods. So, so just in, just in, to, to, to in, in defense of the GDPR, uh, <laughs> the GDPR has an explicit exception for research, Article yeah. 89, yeah. okay, which uh, mm -hmm. I don't think you finished. No. Uh, and that's a you know, social decision by the EU Commission Parliament at the time that if they conflict privacy and research, so subject to whatever conditions, etc., which are aimed to minimize, we would say proportional, um, they prefer research. Okay. Now this is an acknowledgement that yes, we are willing. We they're not hiding. Kind of what you're suggesting is to get away the problem. They say we have a problem. There's a, there may be a conflict between privacy and research interests, and we prefer research. And, but yes, we acknowledge that we are paying a price in terms of privacy. And we are here to minimize it by this and by that and, and various other measures. Uh, I think it's a much better approach to say, yes, there is privacy, but we are willing to give it up than saying there is no privacy to begin with, which is wrong. Right? This is the American approach, and I, I guess it would be Can I add uh, just another point to this? Sure, um, most national... I need to apologize. I have another meeting in <laughs> seven, and I'm in the other part of the country. Thank you. Most national uh, um, frameworks for making secondary use possible include an opt-out <coughs> mechanism and include uh, transparency requirements. So uh, researchers are required to advertise. Uh, to notify people that uh, so, so this and such and such research is being uh, conducted, that is usually in an uh, internal, in a, in an uh, um, uh, central site held by the government, and that would have a list of all research being done, and people would be able to follow that if they wish to. It, it's a strain on them, I acknowledge, and they will be able to ask to opt out of certain research or databases if they don't want to be included. So. That comes from trying to balance those two, I think, those two uh, uh, perspectives. Um. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for the speakers. This was very informative and enlightening. 
I have very, 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 I'll try to be very brief. First of all, I think that we are talking today about the issue of access to information from two sides, and a third side is missing. Some of, some of the speakers say, give us more access, and some of the speakers, for the, for the benefit of the public at large, and uh, we all understand the redeeming value of access to data in the 21st century, so there's no, there's no need to speak about it. And some of us say, hold on with that access, we have privacy, we have other rights, hold on with granting the access. But I think we are missing a, a, a preliminary step, which is a generation of, of information. And no one has said anything about the generation of information. You don't have, you don't have, a, it's a point, I think you don't have access to information unless it's generated. And the, I think it ties with another point, which is people tend to underestimate the cost and effort uh, <coughs> required to generate uh, information. We tend to believe that the information is there, you know, someone went to the doctor and the doctor gave it a prescription and then it's there. It's not the case, I don't have time to go into that. The curation and the organization of data is an enormous challenge and someone must pay for that. So, um, in, uh, and another point on, on that subject is that the higher the investment and the uh, qualities of the, of the person who invests in, in creating the data, the higher should be the quality of the data itself, and then the higher should be the benefit of the using of the data. So, in, uh, users of the, uh, getting access to the data. So, in a way, uh, we are trying to get access to something that is to, to the most to, to generate. Uh, and it struck me as interesting when you, when Limor uh, identified the goals, and all goals had to do with uh, access to information. And there was, I didn't see, uh, sorry if I missed it, any goal of. Uh, incentivizing an ecosystem that uh, creates uh, data and you, you must have that into account when you uh, formulate the r rules of access into data. Uh, another completely very brief show point is that people tend to access in the health industry. They do so in patents law, which is another area in which I, uh, with which I am familiar, and they do so with the health data. Uh, and that has a, a, co a, a con, a cost, because Health is so sensitive, so we, we tend to exaggerate with our solutions, and it tempers with the entire system. It happened in the patent system, and it may happen with the privacy law regime. The issue of consent, for example, is uh, the complete opposite of big data research from the point of view of technology. Uh, so too much emphasis on consent, which is obvious in terms of healthcare, uh, may be detrimental to the public interest in uh, facilitating big data research in the first place. Uh, another comment for uh, uh, Niva and Peter. Um, I think you both talk about, talked about uh, fair use, but in reality, what is uh, more damaging to access to information is contract law. And the question that we've been discussing for a long time, whether you can uh, uh, contract out of the fair use uh, access rights. Uh, because at the end, Information, and I will conclude with that, and it ties to the first point. Information, we need to make a distinction between uh, information as an intangible good, an intangible right, and information as a physical item to which you have physical access. You need physical access. If I, have, if I generated a data and I'm the sole keeper of the data, then I can contract whatever terms I want. And the question is well, how do we as a society? Uh, deal with that in the context of uh, existing information. So, to all of you. Do you want to take more questions? Just because, uh, I think we okay. can answer that. Okay, I can just uh, briefly uh, answer that. Uh, for lack of time, it was very fast, So, uh, but I absolutely agree. I, I put it in the preliminary conditions. If you do not uh, collect data uh, and digitize data, uh, process data, uh, standardize data, create interfaces, putting protocols in place, you, you don't have anything to work with, and that is a Incentivize given. Incentivize all of what you said. And, and, and uh, I didn't mention at all, it's in the slides, but I didn't mention that uh, all, regulation, all the regulations I mentioned, uh, the Israeli one, the US one, start with uh, very extensive provisions of that, of how you create these uh, infrastructures of data use and mechanism of incentives. So in the US, it was incentives given to Medicaid and Medicare uh, providers that implement 
these infrastructures of, of data management that is facilitating to the next step of, of uh, better portability of data. In Israel as well, the government gave incentives to HMOs that will implement FIRE, implement protocols and uh, standardized data. They will get matching budget from the government. The EU Data Act is also uh, uh, include, the whole framework includes incentives and budget from government to match the efforts of health organizations or other organizations that standardize data. So I absolutely agree with you that it's necessary and I think it happens. So let, let me separate your observation about generation of data from fair use, right? Because uh, both are deserve, uh, separate responses. So uh, what you mentioned about generation of data is actually a big debate in 2017 when the European Union was considered whether to offer data producers right based on machine generated data. Uh, and at that time, I think just based on how we look at a lot of the uh, evidence supporting having data producers right, especially coming from the automotive industry, is that a lot of the data has been generated in required resources, but they're generated as a byproduct so they can sell the car, so that they can actually improve uh, the technology within there. They can do other things. Right, so I think a lot of people have a, um, more concern about whether we actually need to have a separate layer of protection, even if it may cost money to actually generate the data, because one, there's no clear reason that there's not enough incentive for them to generate the data in the first place, even though it might require costs, but they can recoup it elsewhere. Uh, and, uh, and the other one is basically the, uh, the disadvantage, both in terms of uh, the public as well as for other industry is too big to overcome even if you may be able to provide some benefits. So eventually when they move on to the data act they're not really revisiting whether they actually need to create a separate data producers right. That doesn't mean that you will not come back when people are thinking about like internet of things or something similar but at least for now I don't think uh, Europe is, is looking at that and most other countries are not considering it. The closest I've seen is basically Japan and Korea, where they are trying to protect it under unfair competition law. So there's still some debate there, and there's still some debate in China about whether they can actually create a sui generis layer of protection. But there's always a question as to whether we need to create incentives in the first place. And a quick response with respect to fair use, I actually don't think uh, fair use will necessarily be the answer uh, to our need for uh, access to information for research purposes. Uh, even within the fair use law uh, uh, in the US, uh, a lot of times you will not necessarily be able to get exactly what you want, although I think for a lot of those uh, uh, fair use examples in a technological context, uh, for example like uh, 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 Google Books, uh, search engine, we have been quite successful in getting the law we want uh, for research purposes. Uh, but I don't think we can just narrow it down to either tax and data mining or fair use. We actually need to go broader if we want to go for uh, the right to research. Yeah, but we have to read the new decision on fair use, right? Maybe it, maybe everything has changed. Who knows about transformative yeah. use? And, 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 I don't know. In, in heaven, I haven't read it yet. Yeah. 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 The use doctrine is gone. They right. decided in, fa in favor of the photographer. So, oh, really? uh, so oh, wow. it's the copyright owner oh. rather than the, oh, the user. Really? Uh, That's amazing. I think uh, um, my prediction uh, was Thomas, but no, no, no. no uh, I think uh, Justice Kagan, but I'm not sure. Okay, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, I just saw a headline. Yeah, that would be. Um, Fantastic. Uh, Peter, just to clarify, I, when I spoke about the incentives, I did not. I was not advocating for a new right. I was saying that in the context of framing the right to access and the limitations of the users, we must also be mindful of incentivizing the creation, the generation of the data in the first place. Sure, sure. No, I think that's fair. I think there's still the debate as to whether they can provide enough incentives uh, because they can make money elsewhere as opposed to your data itself. And to the Israeli, to the Israeli uh, uh, audience, in the context of the healthcare industry, uh, the government has funded nothing in, in terms of generating the data. The, the government is funding only, at least until recently, what the most said about support. But in the past, the government has funded the, the provision of the medical health services. 
and it was up to the HMOs, to, which did it better or, or less uh, well, <coughs> to create, to invest from their own uh, savings in digitization and uh, the, the whole uh, gig. So uh, in a way, this is a private uh, entrepreneurship, and it should be rewarded. I think we are done for the day with a lot of uh, food for thought. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I have to, um, I apologize. It's okay. Um, so, um, first of all, thank you for the great um, talks. And just a few uh, points. Um, one considers um, what's called public data provided by um, online platforms. Um, oftentimes, we as researchers build upon uh, public data, but what's considered public data or defined as public data is the result of very manipulative uh, practices and choice design by online platforms, oftentimes violating privacy. Um, and so there is this tension between our desire to have as much as possible um, data, considered um, public data, um, and also our desire to uh, protect um, users' privacy and other human rights. So this is uh, one point. I'm curious whether you have uh, spent some time um, thinking about that. Um, the second one is for um, Amir. So I'm really, um, I think your, your idea is fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'm curious whether you think that it's more valuable for big actors rather than small actors. Big actors have, have, their, have their reputation very solid, they're not really afraid of sharing their papers um, with the research and other community. So do you, do you see any um, difference um, in this regard? And um, lastly, for um, Peter, so you've mentioned some uh, potential human rights that might be the home for um, um, the right for research. So you mentioned right, uh, to education and, and other human rights. How about the, the, the good old um, right to access information, which is a part of the right, which is freedom of, uh, part of freedom of expression. So that's it. Please do. So yeah, let me, okay, so let me go. Uh, quick answer is, uh, I think, uh, a number of commentators, especially like Christoph Geiger and others, they will, he will start off with freedom of expression, as you mentioned. And then he'll get into, for example, freedom of, uh, to create art and, and culture. Uh, I think that that would be included. Uh, and then uh, right to education, as I mentioned, is right there. I think the right to uh, obtain protection for the uh, uh, in, interest from intellectual production, which is Article 27. Uh, the two is also included, and then right to science is the newest. Mm -hmm. So I think it's closer to more uh, an argument about the penumbra, right? Mm -hmm. Everything is implicit. So the, the question is, what's the right mix of bringing together the different rights and uh, offer protection? The difficulty, especially if we look at the fundamental rights in the EU context, is that you got right to privacy. Uh, you got the freedom to conduct business. Uh, you got other things that might actually go against what you're trying to do with respect to right to research. Then the question is, well, uh, human rights are supposed to be indivisible, supposed to be uh, uh, in the whole system. We need to look at it holistically. Then how can we actually come up with, for example, right to remuneration, how to do exception and limitation, how to actually carve out a system so that it can resolve some of the tensions. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but, but your question is good one. So thank you for the remark and question. Uh, given the voluntary nature of the market, it can f apply to every player, in every sector, every industry, every size, as it were, right? I am not sure, factually, given it has not yet begun to, to actually work, how uh, receptive the law, I mean, how, is there any correlation between a size of corporation and its willingness to engage in such a, a venture? Uh, my guess is that larger companies, depending on the policy that they set for themselves, would be more receptive given the, the massive amount of accumulated knowledge vis-a-vis -vis their research and development processes over the years. And they may here find a way to actually, again, you know, uh, uh, rectify for losses already accumulated. But on the flip side, the, the smaller kind of one-time players that have no other value except that experience lost, 
may tap in better and be more agile in the process. Time will tell. Again, th th that will also be research data that I, you know, may kind of consider to to utilize it on another level. But that remains to be again something for the future. So thank you. And at least we know that if it doesn't work, you will share the data. Of course. <laughs> as, as you have told me. <laughs> of um, yes, please. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking our speakers and the audience. Yes, Mark, let me also thank uh, Professor Michael Birnhack for agreeing to have this yes. in the most you know, amazing way. Um, thank you to the Shanghai Center, to the Zinovitz Center, to Sherry Pasternak, to Ayeret Kuispin and Gozi, and uh, for the IP guys and ladies and gentlemen, uh, in a month's time uh, we will be hosting uh, ISHTIP. Uh, the ISHTIP Annual Conference. ISHTIP is the International Society for History and Theory of IP, which means the cultural studies of IP, and uh, lots of great colleagues from all over the world will be heading to Tel Aviv, uh, not to this room, to a bigger room, uh, and discussing IP for uh, two days. That's uh, June 20 and 21st. Uh, you're more than welcome to join us. Uh, we have some uh, brochures over here and, of course, online uh, at the S. Orbitzer. Uh